Hey artisans, when I mention the invention of recording sound, you probably think of Thomas Edison's phonograph. And while that's all fine and groovy, I'm here to make sure you hear the truth. That is, not only was the phonograph not the first successful attempt to record sound, but that honor might more fittingly belong to an unknown dead guy's severed ear. Allow me to explain. Pop culture appears to believe that language began as a series of grunts, although we don't have any firm evidence to support this. Just as easily, proto-people could have communicated by yodeling. We will never know for sure what voices of ancestral people sounded like, although we do have recreations created by the linguists who study this sort of thing. For example, the phonetics library at Oxford University has recordings of what the progressions of parts of the English language might have sounded like. And we can also interpret ancient musical notes, some of which were written down thousands of years ago. It isn't perfect, probably, and I'm sure there's an ancient music teacher somewhere who's rolling over in her grave, but here's what we think the oldest sheet music may have sounded like when played. But voices are another matter entirely. To reproduce a vocal production so that it sounds recognizably human requires an extremely precise capture of sound waves. And finding material sensitive enough to capture those waves as tiny vibrations was difficult for people. At least it used to be. Now any jackass can record himself speaking with minimal effort and upload it to the cloud where presumably it will stay long past his death. Hi! But humans did have one thing that they knew could capture sound in an interpretable fashion. The human ear. What if you could take an ear, attach its inner vibrating structure to a very sensitive recording device, and then make noises at it while it reproduced those noises as physically recorded sound waves? As crazy as it sounds, it must have been even crazier when it worked. But first, let's talk about Edison. Thomas Edison, pictured here planning on adding another golden statue to his billiard room, is sometimes given credit for producing the world's first audio recording with the phonograph. For example, the nursery rhyme, Mary Had a Little Lamb, was inscribed on tinfoil using a sensitive needle that could then be played back by running the same needle over the recording and amplifying the vibrations. You can actually still listen to this recording today, thanks to the painstaking work of restorationists. The problem was that tinfoil warps easily, and so playing the recording back too many times could destroy the recording. So what these researchers did was image the tinfoil with a sensitive camera, which was then interpreted by software to reproduce the original sound. What I am about to play for you is not the original audio due to copyright restrictions, but a recreation that Edison made later in life that is not copyright protected. Have a listen. The uh, first words I spoke in the the original phonograph, a little piece of practical poetry. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. So, to the credit of Edison and his team, the phonograph was the first successful playback of recorded audio. However, it was not, as many incorrectly assume, the first successful recording of audio. Edison's Mary Had a Little Lamb recording was made in 1878. But in France, an inventor had beaten Edison to the punch of recording the human voice by nearly two decades. This earlier device was called a phonautograph, patented in 1857 by Frenchman Edouard Léon Scott de Martinville, whom we will call Scott because that is the only one of those names that I am confident in pronouncing. Scott was interested to see if the recent advancements in capturing images using fake eyes, cameras, could be replicated using sound and the human ear. The inner part of the human ear contains many intricate structures, crucially including the tympanic membrane, also known as the eardrum, which is a thin, vibrating layer that assists in transferring external sound waves into internal vibrations. 
Using the inner human ear as a model, he first built a conceptual replica of the anatomical parts, and on one end attached a funnel to direct the sound of his voice, and on the other end attached a stylus, a bristle that would vibrate along the paper that was being recorded on top of. The paper was coated in a thin layer of carbon called lamp black because it was deposited by lamp smoke. This carbon layer was easy to disturb with the bristle, and was therefore sensitive enough to pick up and record the vibrations. In later versions of the device, this recording medium was wrapped around a cylinder that could be rotated, which helped increase surface area and the consistency of the recording stylus movement. He recorded sound successfully, but the problem was he was unable to play the sound back. Scott's recorded sound waves were in two dimensions, on paper, instead of in three dimensions like Edison's later tinfoil experiments. However, what Scott couldn't do back then, we can do now. In 2008, a team of sound scientists that you can learn about on the website firstsounds.org successfully took the images traced by Scott 150 years prior and reconstructed the original audio. It wasn't easy to do this because they first had to figure out the speed at which the recording cylinder was moving. Take a listen. This is the first known recording of a human voice. It's tough to make out. One, because it's in French, and two, because it was made a very, very long time ago with imprecise methodology. It's a song called Claire de Lune, and before the scientists figured out the correct playback speed, they thought it might have been sung by a woman because the pitch seemed high, but as it turns out, it was probably recorded by Scott himself. Understandably, when Scott found out that there was an American inventor taking credit for the first recorded sounds, he was outraged by that New York electrician. The good news is, according to NPR, at a recent gathering in New Jersey, both Edison and Scott were honored for their contributions to the inventions, and the great-grandsons of both men met up and shook hands. Now, just to clarify, Scott was not the one who made his phonautograph out of an actual human ear. The inventor who did that came along years later. You've probably heard of his name, Alexander Graham Bell. That's right, before he became famous for his work on the telephone, Bell experimented with recording sound waves using a real human ear. He worked with physician Clarence J. Blake, who Bell claimed came up with the whole disembodied ear part of the experiment. In fact, Bell said himself that this ear-based device accelerated his work on the telephone because it gave him new ideas. Blake provided the ear, with the surrounding skull still attached. They took the parts of the inner ear, including the ossicle bones and tympanic membrane, attached a bristle, and after lubricating them with water and glycerin, shouted into the ear in order to record the vibrations on a rotating cylinder. And not only did it work, but Bell described these vibration recordings as beautiful. If you're wondering where the ear came from, I don't blame you, but unfortunately all we know is that Blake procured it somehow. Just out of curiosity, let's see if we can uh, find ourselves a human ear. Uh, wait, is that? Oh, nope, nope. All right, time to hit up Craigslist. The happy ending is that the experimenters that came before Edison are receiving more credit for their contributions lately. I mean, without them, how would we be able to get across important audio messages like this one? Hello! <coughs> If you didn't like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs down and type out a very angry comment as to why, and I'll print off the comment and give it to Mockingbird to use as bedding. If you did like the video and want to see more like it, make sure you subscribe and check out my various social media links below. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to erase my browsing history again so it doesn't look like I'm buying human body parts. See you next time!